Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the this Lewis and Clark program. It's December 6, 2020. We're pleased to have you with us. Uh, to the, the This program is called Lewis and Clark and their Christmases, 1803, 1804, and 1805. Barb Kubik in Vancouver, Washington. Give us a wave, Barb. And then uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, is Jerry Garrett. Go ahead and wave to us, Jerry. And uh, Sarah Cawley. Sarah, why don't you wave to us? You're in Pennsylvania now for a while. Um, uh, you're our executive director of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, and the website is lewisandclark.org. Thank you for that talk that you just gave. And, and it's important that people know about the national organization and join the national organization. Once again, lewisandclark.org. And let's see, Yvonne, is it time now for you to do the introduction? I'd be happy to introduce our speakers. It's great to see you all here today. And I'm glad we had a chance to visit just briefly before we got started. And, you know, with all this lockdown, it's just great to see friendly faces and new faces. So we're glad you're all here. But let me tell you about our two speakers for today. First, you'll hear from Jerry Garrett, who's in uh, St. Louis, joining us. And Jerry Garrett first discovered the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation on an extended road trip in 1984. He has served as a board member, a committee chair, and annual meeting preparation participant for the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. And he enjoys sharing or showing off uh, tidbits of Lewis and Clark that he has found. So uh, we're welcoming Jerry today as our first speaker. And our second speaker is Barb, Barb Kubik, who is in Vancouver, Washington. And, and just as an aside, when I first met Barb, she said she was in Vancouver, Washington, and I looked it up on a map and I said, oh, that's a suburb of Portland, Oregon. And she, she corrected me right away. So now I'm corrected. Um, Portland, Oregon is a suburb of Vancouver, Washington, just so we're all clear about that. Uh, and Barb is a historian who has researched and written about many stories of the Corps of Discovery, from John Coulter and Condors to Christmas, and from the Snake River to Sacagawea or Sacagawea to supplies. Barb is a longtime member of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation Board of Directors and a contributor to we proceeded on, which is our quarterly journal. So welcome to both of our speakers today. Here is the great Jerry Garrett. I'm waiting for um, my techno team, Yvonne. Here we have it. We have okay. it. Everybody's muted, so I'm going to take that means that everybody can see the screen. Lewis and Clark, Christmas 1803, Camp de Bois. So Lewis and Clark spent their first Christmas, December of 1803, at Camp de Bois in Illinois. Uh, but before looking at how they celebrated that winter holiday, let's review how they ended up in that place. When I was a child and going to school, I was taught that Thomas Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase and then he sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark out to explore it. When I became involved as an enthusiast and student of the Lewis and Clark expedition, I learned that that was not exactly the chain of events. The expedition really began when Thomas Jefferson sent in January of 1803, a secret request to Congress for monies to fund an exploratory uh, journey across the continent, which was approved by uh, the Congress. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase was the unexpected product of negotiations with Napoleon stemming from issues with the Port of New Orleans. The Louisiana Purchase was signed in Paris on April 30, 1803. That's three months after Jefferson made that request for funds. The uh, Purchase was signed by Robert Livingston, U.S. Minister to France, and James Monroe, Jefferson's neighbor, and the special envoy he had sent to help solve the New Orleans problem. Signing for France was Francois de Barbet Marbeau. Because of the slow speed of communication in the early 1800s, Jefferson did not learn of this transaction until the day after the 4th of July, 
July 5, 1803. Therefore, when Lewis and Clark, having come down the Ohio River and turned to the right and entered the Mississippi River, they headed north toward the confluence with the Missouri River. So the land to the east was American land. And this was the result of the treaty at the end of the Revolutionary War between England and the colonial states. The new country claimed this land based upon the military successes of George Rogers Clark at places like Kaskaskia, Vincennes, and Cahokia. And George Rogers Clark was the older brother of the expedition's William Clark. As they continued up the Mississippi River on the west was land that had been ceded to Spain by the French following the French loss in the French and Indian War, or as it was known in Europe, the Seven Years War. And that war ended in 1763. So France held the land for 40 years. In 1800, Napoleon arranged the swap of this North American land with the Spanish, giving it back to him and France and offering the Spanish some land in Italy. And then three years later, he sold it to the Americans. So now as Lewis and Clark are headed up the Mississippi River, both the land to the west and the east is American land. Now this is a picture of Thomas Hutchings map of the central Mississippi River Valley. And the map was made in the late 1700s. In the lower corner, and I've tried to highlight it with the red arrow, you can see the little village of Kaskaskia. Uh, Lewis and Clark stopped here and it was a military post and they added several men to the Corps from Kaskaskia and several of the journal writers uh, joined the expedition here from their post in Kaskaskia. And just to the left of the descriptive words, you can faintly see the route of the road from Kaskaskia to Cahokia. Now we know when they left Kaskaskia and headed up north, Clark stayed with the boats and Lewis continued on land on horseback. Now, when you come to St. Louis to spend a lot of your money, and if you get to this section of Illinois, you'll see that it's a big bluff. So it's unclear as to whether or not Lewis went along closer to the river or whether he went up on the bluff as he went to Cahokia. I think it's highly probable that he went up on the bluff and followed the Kaskaskia to Cahokia Road, but we have no documentation to support that. But it's very possible that this is the route that Lewis took. Now this is Nicholas de Finiel's map of 1788, excuse me, 1798, which was made just uh, five years, four or five years before Lewis and Clark arrived in the area. It shows the Illinois town of Cahokia, the first French settlement in the mid Mississippi River Valley, having been founded in 1699, several decades before the founding of New Orleans. Lewis and Clark arrived here in Cahokia on December 7th, 1803, which would be tomorrow. Toward the upper part of the map, one can see a bold letter B, which I've pointed to with a red arrow, which marks the site of St. Louis on the western side of the river. This is the Cahokia Courthouse as it appears today. Although the building has traveled several places over its life, its core units remain the same building that stood in Cahokia when Lewis and Clark arrived. It is one of the few buildings in America that remain that Lewis and Clark saw. And this is the Holy Family Church in Cahokia. It was built in 1799, making it one of the oldest and quite possibly the oldest building in metropolitan St. Louis. Although there is no documentation that Lewis and Clark were in this building, given the significance of the church to the community and the role of the priest in the hierarchy of the community, they almost surely were but no documentation supports that. So even though the Louisiana Purchase made the land to the west of the Mississippi River American land, the official paperwork had not been concluded or formalized by the time Lewis and Clark arrived in Cahokia in December of 1803. It remained under the administrative responsibility of the Spanish who had continued in that role following the 1800 swap of land 
with the French for the Italian land. So the day after they arrived at Cahokia, December 8th, Lewis went across the river to St. Louis to visit with the Spanish commandant, Carlos de Halt de Lassus. And through the wonders of the internet, thank you, Al Gore, I was able to find a um, painting of uh, Carlos de Halt de Lassus. Uh, Lewis went there to inquire about making winter quarters somewhere on the west side of the Mississippi River, even perhaps some distance up the Missouri River. But Delossus reported that he could not give permission to ascend the Missouri River to Lewis because it was a military group and he had no permission from his superiors. And per Gary Moulton's footnotes, the decision had already been made to winter in Wood River. So Lewis was not unduly distressed by Delossus's refusal. This is a screenshot of a Google map which shows the relationship of Camp Dubois to St. Louis. So St. Louis is circled in red at the bend in the river, and that's uh, where the arch stands today and where the colonial vi village was in 1800. And the little red dots toward the top is the location of Camp Dubois. It was about 17 miles north of colonial St. Louis. Although most people and certainly most non-Lewis and Clarkers say that the expedition began in St. Louis, that's really far from reality. The Corps arrived at the Wood River site on December 12th, four days after they arrived in Illinois, and commenced building what Clark described as their huts the very next day. Clark does not note the one day when the project was completed. He does record, however, that on Christmas Eve, December 24th, that the men continued to put up and covered the necessary huts. This is a picture of the replica fort today on the grounds of the Illinois Lewis and Clark State Historic Park. We can get an idea of what Christmas day was like for Lewis and Clark by looking at Clark's writings on the days before. On December 23, Clark writes that a neighbor, a Mr. Morrison, arrived with corn, probably for the animals. Another neighbor, Mr. Griffith, came from his farm with a load of turnips and et cetera. And the trusty Drewlyard, after a long hunt, had killed three deer. The next day, December 25, Clark purchased a cargo of turnips. Drewlyard arrived with a three deer and a bonus, five turkeys. John Shields was sent to buy butter. So now Lewis and Clark were ready to celebrate Christmas Day at Cahokia. But there was one problem. Lewis was not at Cahokia. Of the 154 days the Corps spent at Camp Dubois, Lewis was there for quite possibly only 28 days. He did not arrive at Camp Dubois for his first visit until January 30th. I couldn't find any documentation as to where Lewis might have been on Christmas Day, but quite probably he was in Cahokia. The French brought to their American settlements long-standing Christmas traditions. These included spiritual celebrations, feasting, games, music, and dancing. And here are some French colonial Christmas holiday traditions I found. I don't know how to pronounce this word, papalotes, but these are chocolate or candied fruit wrapped in a golden sparkling paper with fringed edges. And inside there's a little note written on it. The familiar creche or nativity scene were displayed in many French homes. They are little clay figures which are bought at Christmas marketplaces. There are plenty of pieces available so one could create a small or a large creche in their home. Les Treyes or 13 desserts is a Provençal French Christmas tradition. The 13 desserts after a main Christmas meal represent Christ and the 12 apostles at the Last Supper. And this gentleman, La Prairie Follentard, Father Spanker, is the partner and helper of St. Nicholas. He decides if each child behaved goodly or badly, and he is the one who does the spanking to bad behaving okay. children. So what were Clark and the men doing at Camp Dubois on Christmas day? Clark was the only journal writer for that date and he records, number one, he was awakened by a Christmas discharge. Number two, he found that some of the men had gotten drunk and two of them had even fought. 
Three, the men frolicked, and my efforts to find what frolic meant 200 years ago were not fruitful, so we'll have to just imagine. Number four, he reports the men hunted all day, and even more turkey were killed. Number five, Shields returned with the butter and also some cheese. And lastly, Clark comments that Indians came to, quote, take Christmas with us, and Clark gave them a bottle of whiskey as they went off. Clark concludes with some more information and includes one comment that might have been the best Christmas present Lewis and Clark received that day, although it would take months of crossing the continent to truly appreciate the blessings of this gift. Clark writes that Drulliard finally decided and said he would go with the group. In the months that followed, Drulliard became one of, if not the, key men of the expedition. In retrospect, his decision was quite possibly the best Christmas gift Lewis and Clark had. Thank you, Jerry. That was great. So now it's Barb Kubik's turn to talk about 1804. So I will be talking about keeping Christmas at Fort Mandan in 1804 and Fort Clatsop in 1805. And as I talk about their Christmases, you're going to notice some consistencies with frolics and hunting and the consumption of alcohol. <clears throat> In the week leading up to the Corps of Discovery's second Christmas together, the men were very busy hunting bison and setting their pickets around their newly constructed winter quarters near the confluence of the Missouri and the Knife Rivers in present day North Dakota. The weather was exceedingly cold that week. Clark noted it was minus 43 degrees at sunrise on the 17th and minus 32 degrees at sunrise the following day. All of the journal keepers described the brisk trade between the Mandan and Hidatsa people and the Corps in exchange for multicolored dried corn and beans a welcome addition to their diet, the Corps offered their visitors awls, knives, and buttons, to name just a few of the more popular trade goods. According to Sergeant John Ordway, the Corps finished setting the pickets around their winter quarters on Christmas Eve, and then started construction on the blacksmith shop. As the day drew to a close, the party fired the swivel guns in honor of Christmas Eve, and the captains issued flour, dried apples, and pepper, and other articles to each mess so the men could celebrate Christmas in a proper and social manner. And I might add, on departure from Camp de Bois in the spring of 1804, the captains had established three squads, each under the command of one of the sergeants, Floyd, and when Floyd died, Gas, Ordway, and Pryor. One man in each squad was assigned the duty of cook. Clark does not tell us how and why the men came to be chosen, the cooks, but eventually the three cooks would be Private Peter Weiser, or Weiser, Private William Warner, and Private John Collins. Some of you familiar with the expedition's journals know that Private Collins was also a beer maker. <clears throat> the Corps of Discovery ushered Christmas Day in with two discharges of a swivel and a round of small arms or a volley from the entire party. Clark poured everyone a glass of brandy and then the Corps raised the 15 star, 15 stripe flag in the garrison. Once the flag was raised, the party celebrated with another glass. According to White House, the officers this day named our fort, Fort Mandan. After the flags raising ceremony and that second glass of brandy, the Corps cleared one of the rooms and began dancing, probably to the fiddle of Pierre Crisat and perhaps George Gibson. <clears throat> Other musical instruments that day may have included a jaws harp and a tambourine, 
two instruments we know they carried with them. White House noted the Corps had two violins and plenty of musicians in the party. At 10 a.m., the captains issued a third glass of brandy. And at 1 p.m., the, the sound of a gun called the Corps to a festive Christmas dinner in each mess. 90 minutes later, the sound of another gun called the men back to the dancing, which continued in a jovial manner until 8 p.m. that night. The three wives of the Corps' two Hidatsa and Mandan interpreters, Toussaint Charbonneau and René Jassin, watched the festive festivities with amusement. Gas, Ordway, and White House all noted that the two captains had asked the Mandan and Hidatsa people not to visit the fort on Christmas Day, but neither Clark nor Lewis wrote anything about that request in their own journals. On Christmas day, Ordway wrote, the party had the best to eat that could be had. I'm sure he might have been remembering fondly the 13 desserts of the year before and continued firing, dancing and frolicking during the whole day, adding they enjoyed a Merry Christmas during the day and evening until nine o'clock. And like Jerry, I could not find a definition in 1800 of the word frolic. The captain's weather log for Christmas day reveals a temperature of 15 degrees at sunrise. And by 4 p.m., the temperature had climbed just five degrees. According to Clark, in the days leading up to Christmas, the Mandan people had frequently come to the fort with both gifts of food and food to trade. One of the gifts was a kettle of boiled simmons, beans, corn, and choke cherries. This dish, Clark noted, was considered a treat among those people. Recent recipes for a Mandan style soup, similar to this gift, have made the mistake of thinking Clark Simmons were a hard rind winter squash or pumpkin and not a tender rind summer squash, such as a patty pan or a zucchini. And if any of you want, I can provide you with the recipe at the end of the program. <clears throat> to acquire a better picture of the course Christmas activities, we do need to look at all the journals. For example, on Christmas day, Gas, Ordway and White House all wrote the men woke the captains with a round of small arms by the whole core. Clark noted they were awakened before daybreak with a discharge of three volleys from all the party, including specifically the French speaking engagés. Clark wrote he dispensed taffia and permitted the guns to be fired as the corps raised the flag. Both Ordway and Clark called the rounds taffy or taffia, which is an inexpensive rum made from low grade brown sugar um, or sugar dregs and molasses. <clears throat> it is gas and White House who refer to each ration as a glass of brandy. Brandy or taffia, it's doubtful the drinks were served in glasses. Clark was the only journal keeper to note some of the men went hunting that day, which apparently may have been a fairly common tradition among men over the Christmas holidays. At Fort Clatsop, one year later, the 33 member Corps of Discovery kept Christmas at their third and last winter quarters. After another night of some rain at different times, and showers of hail with intervals of fair starlight, Christmas morning, 1805, dawned rainy and cool at Fort Clatsa. Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark wrote they were awakened at daybreak by the discharge of the firearms of all our party and a salute, a shout, and a song, which the whole party joined in under our windows after which they retired to their rooms, were cheerful all morning. 
Sergeant Gass wrote the Corps paraded in front of the captain's cabin, then fired a round of small arms to wish the commanding officers a Merry Christmas. According to Private Whitehouse, the men's salute at daybreak was the firing of their guns, a traditional way to honor the day. So there, there is a real consistency there with the salute, the shout, and the firing of guns. This is the first entry though, where they talk about Christmas carols. The Corps may have sung any one of a number of Christmas carols that morning, many of which we would recognize today. That is, we would recognize the words, but not necessarily the music. Over the centuries, the music or the tunes for many popular Christmas songs has changed. For example, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen was a popular 18th century Christmas song, but the tune we sing today did not appear until the mid 19th century. The Corps might have sung any one of these carols, many of which date back, at least in words, to the 16th century. God rest ye merry gentlemen. And in 1800, it was God rest ye merry, comma, gentlemen. Whereas we today say, God rest ye, comma, pause, merry gentlemen. Adeste Fideles, or O Come All Ye Faithful, which was a very popular 17th century Latin carol that in, early, in the early 1800s was being translated into a number of different languages, including French, English, Spanish, and probably German. The first Noel, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and Deck the Halls. Deck the Halls was originally a Welsh folk song that was later translated into English and adapted into the um, pantheon of Christmas carols. The French speaking members of the party may have sung their own French carols, Noël Novelle, or Sing We Now of Christmas, which was a 15th century carol, Un Flambeau, Jeanette Isabella, or Bring the Torch, Jeanette and Isabel, again from the 1500s, and of course, Adeste Fidelis. I'm often asked, did York sing? We do not know if York sang, nor what Christmas spirituals he might have sung. Two of the oldest, most popular Christmas spirituals were not set down on paper until the mid 1800s. One was Go Tell It on the Mountain, and the other, Children, Go Where I Send Thee. <clears throat> The shout may have been, as Gas described it, a loud and hearty Merry Christmas. A shout was also an old Southern tradition. If you could surprise a friend with a shout of Christmas gift first, that person owed you a gift. And certainly this Christmas, there was an exchange of gifts. The captains handed out tobacco to the men who used it and silk handkerchiefs to those who did not. Only Clark recorded the gifts he received that day. Fleece hosiery, vest, drawers, and socks from his good friend Lewis, a pair of moccasins from White House, a small Indian basket from private Silas Goodrich, and from Sacagawea, he received two dozen weasel or ermine tails such as those used to make the elegant tippet her brother had given Lewis in August. Of the three Christmases the Corps celebrated together, this is the only written record we have of a gift exchange. It does not mean there was not a gift exchange among the Corps as friends, colleagues, and family, but it was not recorded. Unlike their Christmas dinners at Camp Dubois in Fort Mandan, dinner that night was unremarkable and free of alcohol. Poor elk, spoiled fish, and some ruts. It was, Clark concluded, a bad Christmas dinner. Sometime during the week preceding Christmas, visiting Chinook and speaking people had brought a welcome gift of 
black roots, one of many starchy vegetable roots the Native Americans enjoyed. Perhaps the best gifts of all that day were the Corps' new home, Fort Clatsop, and their good health. According to Ordway and White House, the party was all moved into our new garrison or fort, which our officers have named after a nation of Indians who reside near us called the Clatsop. Ordway added, we have no ardent spirits, but are all in good health, which we esteem more than all the ardent spirits in the world. The journal keepers noted that despite the damp weather, the steady diet of poor elk meat and fresh water and the labor of constructing their winter quarters, the party was in mostly good health, adding that good health was a blessing which we esteem more than all the luxuries this life can afford. So whatever Christmas holiday you celebrate this year, Hanukkah, Christmas, the winter solstice or Kwanzaa, may your own holidays be like those of the Corps in a proper and social manner, filled with fair starlight, close to your family and friends, comfortable in your homes, with the best to eat and in good health. Thank you. Barb, thank you very much. Okay, there we go. There's the first one. <clears throat> All right. So the we're good to go. The expedition arrived back in St. Louis on September 23, 1806. Within a few weeks, Lewis and Clark were on their way to Louisville and then on to meet with President Jefferson. The other men of the expedition began to scatter and begin their post-expedition lives. What were the members of the expedition doing that first Christmas after their great American adventure? Here are some of the things that I found. Where did Seaman spend Christmas? We don't know. The last time he is mentioned in the journals is July 15, 1806, that summer. Lewis comments on how the mosquitoes continued to bother him in a most severe way. Many speculate that the dog did not make it back, that he was abandoned in the race to get to the Missouri River after the encounter with the Blackfeet, that he was never again mentioned in the journals is also used as an argument that he did not make it to St. Louis. But dog lovers have trouble accepting that outcome. A book of epitaphs was published in 1814 by a Timothy Allen, who I believe was a clergyman. He quoted the inscription on a dog collar held for display in the Alexandria, Virginia Masonic Museum. And on this dog collar, it read, my name is Seaman, the dog of Meriwether Lewis, whom I accompanied to the Pacific Ocean through the interior of the continent of North America. The museum subsequently burned and the dog collar has never been found to support the inscription recorded by Allen in 1814. But if this quote is taken as proof that Seaman made it back, it still does not answer the question of where Seaman was on Christmas 1806. On another point, which I think is more legend than fact, is that this dog so was, was so devoted to Lewis that at Lewis's death, he lay on Lewis's grave until he himself also died. If that be true, then the argument could be made that the dog was with Lewis on Christmas 1806. So again, where was Seaman on Christmas 1806? Add it to the suicide or murder folder. John Coulter. I'm unaware of any documentation that would support where John Coulter was on Christmas 1806. We do know that on August 15, 1806, Clark records in his journal, Coulter, one of our men expressed a desire to join some trappers. Lewis and Clark recognized that the offer was a very advantageous one for Coulter, and they agreed to his request. On Coulter's departure, Clark recorded gifting him some small articles that they did not want, as well as some powder and lead. Lewis and Clark continued their return and headed east. Coulter and the two trappers turned west. There is no documentation. Know that he, quote, discovered Coulter's hell which is now known as Yellowstone National Park. 
By 1809, he was still in Montana, near the Three Forks, where he and former Corps member John Potts had their misfortunate encounter with the Blackfeet, which resulted in the famous uh, Coulter's run in his birthday suit to save his life. So I think it's safe to presume that Coulter spent Christmas 1806 somewhere in Montana along the banks of either the Missouri or Yellowstone rivers. The Charbonneau family, Toussaint Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and the infant Jean Baptiste. On the day after Coulter's request to be released, the Corps of Discovery left the Mandan villages and began their return to St. Louis. And on that day, August 17, Clark records their farewell to the Charbonneaus. We also took our leave of T. Charbonneau, his Snake Indian wife, Sacagawea, and their son child, who had accompanied us on our route to the Pacific Ocean in the capacity of interpreter and interpretress. Three days later, Clark wrote Charbonneau from the Areca villages. His letter included his offer to take Pomp, the boy, and raise him as his own son. We don't hear about the Charbonneau family until 1810, when they came to St. Louis to leave the boy with Clark. So again, I think it is safe to conclude that the Charbonneau family spent Christmas 1806 in their homeland of the Mandan and Hadatsa villages. There were some other Indians. Joining the Corps of Discovery as they left the Mandan villages were the Mandan chief Sheheki, his wife Yellowcorn, and his son, as well as the interpreter Rene Jesson, his wife, and their two children. Charbonneau did not go as interpreter on this return to the East because he did not speak Mandan. Uh, now these two portraits, uh, the chief is on the left and Yellowcorn's on the right, were done by St. Memon, who did the um, similar portrait um, of Lewis. And I think these are significant. These are uh, two of the few contemporary renditions of people that met or knew Lewis and Clark. Uh, this group, Sheheke, Yellowcorn, Renacious Home, their spouses and children, accompanied Lewis through the entire trip to the East. Thus they spent Christmas with Meriwether Lewis. York. William Foley in his book, Wilderness Journey, places York with Clark as Clark continues his 1806 journey eastward toward Washington, D.C. Meriwether Lewis. Lewis and Clark journeyed together to Louisville. From there, they took different routes. Lewis arrived in Charlottesville on December 15th. A large celebration dinner was held there and many of the toasts given were recorded. It is not known if the Indians accompanying Lewis were included in these celebrations. From there, Lewis left for Washington, D.C., where he arrived on December 28th, three days after Christmas. Thus, Lewis and his entourage of Indians spent Christmas Day somewhere in Virginia. And William Clark. When Clark left Louisville, he headed to Fincastle, Virginia. His good friend, William Preston, lived there. Clark would name one of his sons after William Preston. Preston's wife was one of the Hancock sisters and Clark was there on December 23rd for the double wedding of sister Mary Hancock to John Griffin. Also in attendance at the double wedding was the youngest Hancock sister, Julia, just 15 years old. She would become Clark's first wife. So I conclude that Clark spent Christmas 1806 with the married celebrants in Fincastle, Virginia. And the other of the two weddings was that of Harriet Kennerly, a cousin to the Hancocks, and she married John Radford. She would later become a widow and become Clark's second wife. So pretty interesting that in Christmas of 06, Clark was at a wedding in which was attendance the two females who eventually became his two wives. And a final and perhaps sad note on Clark and Christmas Day, the second wife, Harriet Kennerly Radford Clark, died on Christmas Day, 1831, making Clark a widower for the second time for the last seven years of his life. And from me to you, a Merry Christmas. <laughs>